Whether you want to use vintage lenses, modern low-cost cinema lenses, or even the high-end cinema lenses from the likes of Ari, Cook, and so forth, all of these lenses have one thing in common. They're all fully manual. What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5C. So yep, you guessed it, we're talking about using manual lenses on the EOS R5C this time. And more specifically, we're talking about manual lenses that don't communicate electronically with the camera. So basically, that's anything that's not Canon's EF or RF mount cinema lenses or Zeiss's EF mount primes. Now, specifically for this video, I'm using a mount-adapted Canon FD 50mm f1.8 uh, Prime for the demonstrations that you'll be seeing. However, everything I'm going to talk about would also apply to native RF mount cinema lenses from companies like Seven Artisans, Venus Optics, Suri, and actually now even Cook, as well as adapted PL mount cinema lenses from, you know, all the big names, Ari, Cook, Zeiss, Anginu, Sigma, etc. And what I won't be delving into, as I said, or alluded to at least, is Canon's own EF and RF mount cinema lenses. There's a lot of complexity there. I don't have access to them at the moment, and it's really a topic on its own for another video. So with that said, let's get this show on the road. Given that manual lenses are the standard way of working in the cinema industry, and the R5C's movie mode comes from Canon Cinema EOS OS, which was developed for that market, it shouldn't be a surprise that the R5C just works with manual lens right out of the box. Just mount a lens, put a card in your camera, and you're ready to start shooting. So is that it? Well, obviously not quite, or I wouldn't be making this video. On one hand, shooting video on the R5C is a pretty manual process any way you cut it. As a result, there aren't really any major snazzy features or automations like, say, depth of field stacking that having a manual lens that the camera can't control will break. Now, that said, without being able to communicate with the lens, there are still plenty of functions that won't be available on your camera. So on the small, but maybe annoying side, there is no live aperture or t-stop display in the viewfinder and no distance scale or focusing distance overlay either. Of course, without the electronic iris control, we also lose auto iris, which combined with the lack of auto shutter speed modes leaves only ice auto ISO as the only available auto exposure option. More significantly, you won't have access to any of the lens distortion corrections or the focusing guide focusing aid. Now that said, there are also some features that I was pleasantly surprised to see were still available and worked. For instance, digital image stabilization. While the R5C lacks the sensor shift in-body image stabilizer that its photo, photo counterparts has, it does have digital st stabilization, and that does work with these manual lenses. The settings for this are found in the three entries on the Camera Setup 7 menu. The first is Digital Image Stabilization, or Digital IS. This simply turns digital stabilization on and off. Second is Digital IS Mode, and this controls the amount of stabilization that's applied. Here you have a choice between Standard and High. High provides more stabilization, however this comes at the cost of further reducing the angle of view of your lens. Finally, since the camera can't automatically get the lens's focal length, the last entry will be where you enter it manually in the lens focal length setting. So those are the settings for digital IS, but how should you set them up? Well, first, let me say, start by saying that I don't use digital IS. Well, not primarily. I will use it if it's absolutely necessary. And my experience, it works, and it works certainly well in a pinch, but Personally, I prefer either optical image stabilization or a actual gimbal to stabilize my video when I'm shooting. Now that said, choosing between standard and high, the most obvious difference that you see that high crops your images more than the standard does for the extra stabilization. That also means that if you're shooting at 8K and MP4 format, it's going to be upscaling a not 8K image, so there will be some image quality loss. Now, my recommendation here is to use the lowest level of stabilization that sufficiently stabilizes your footage. Now, as for the focal length, well, what you enter is the actual focal length of the lens that you're using. Even if you're using a Super 35 or APS-C format lens or shooting in any of the crop modes on the R5C, don't adjust the focal length of the lens for the crop factor. But what then do you do if you're using a zoom? 
Well, unfortunately, Canon doesn't provide any real guidance here. And in fact, guidance in general on this is sparse, regardless of what manufacturer's information you're looking at. I'm looking at into testing this at some point in the future, but due to the complexity of testing image stabilization, that won't be happening anytime soon. My best suggestion based on the research I've done and the recommendations I've seen in other brands is to use the actual focal length your lens is currently set at. Now, fortunately on a cinema camera like the R5C, that should be a bit less of an issue than it is on a photo camera where you're gonna be zooming and taking pictures quite frequently. Of course, this also means that you're not gonna be doing any dolly zooms with the R5C handheld with the image stabilizer on, or at least they're not gonna be optimal. Now that brings me to exposure and metering. Anybody who's shot with the R5C already knows the exposure modes on it are very different from the EOS or photo cameras. Now by and large, the camera uses what amounts to manual mode and that's what you're going to use most of the time. Now, while there is an auto iris setting, it's obviously unavailable if the camera can't control the iris anyway. So leaving auto ISO as your only available auto exposure mode if you happen to need to do that. Now, metering on the R5C is also markedly different from Canon's photo cameras as well. However, all of the metering options or modes are available when you are shooting with these manual lenses. Now that brings me to the last major topic I want to talk about and the biggest topic I'm going to talk about in this video, which is manual focusing and the manual focus aids. So like the EOS R5, the R5C has three manual focusing aids, magnification, focus peaking, and the focus guide. With fully manual lenses, the focus guide unfortunately is unavailable, which is a bit of a shame given that really is one of the best focusing aids I have or find on the camera. So with the loss of the focusing guide, we're just down to magnification and peaking. Of these, I'll start with magnification since it's easier to deal with. If you use magnification or if you've used magnification on the R5, then mag the magnification function on the R5C is kind of the same, but a bit def different. Now by default, magnification is enabled by pressing the magnification button, button number two, or the button with the magnifying glass. Uh, these are all the same button. And in fact, these are all the same button as you would use on the EOS R5 or Canon's photo cameras. However, unlike the R5, this button can be reprogrammed on the R5C for another function. This is of course done through the assignable buttons menu section. Now, if the magnification button has been reprogrammed, you don't lose out on magnification. You just have to turn it on in the menus. The R5C also differs from the R5 in that pressing the magnification button doesn't step you through various zoom levels. Instead, the magnification button acts like a toggle for the magnification mode. Press it once and the camera will zoom in. Press it a second time and the camera goes back to the unzoomed view. To change the actual zoom level while in the magnified mode, press either the set button or straight in on the joystick. Now, if you're like me and you're wondering what the joystick is because you come from Canon's photo cameras, it's the multi-controller that you would know from photo cameras. It's the same thing. Also, unlike the R5, on the R5C, you have three zoom levels at your disposal, 2X, 8X, and 10X. Now, moving the magnification frame is done either with the joystick or the touch screen. If you're using the joystick, then think of what you're doing as moving the magnification frame. That is, if you push the joystick up, the magnified area moves towards the top of the frame. If you push the joystick down, the magnified area moves towards the bottom. If you use the touch screen, then you want to think of this like natural scrolling that you find on most smartphone and touch devices these days. Instead of moving the magnification frame, you're actually moving the image under it. So if you drag your finger from the top to the bottom, then the magnified area moves towards the top of your image. If you drag your finger from the bottom up, then the magnified area moves towards the bottom. To recenter the magnifier, the only option available is to press the cancel button. Finally, there are a few settings available for configuring magnification, and you'll find these all on the Assistance Function 3 menu page. Now, the first setting on that page, Magnification, simply turns magnification on and off. This is what you can use instead of a button if you've reprogrammed that button to do something else. 
Now, the second setting, magnification output, controls which display is magnified. So unlike the R5, which magnifies all of the outputs, the R5C will only magnify one. Here's where you choose whether you're using the LCD, the EVF, or the HDMI terminal to be magnified. Now, unfortunately, what's missing here is that you can't select multiple outputs or choose a internal output for both the LCD and EVF, depending on which one you're actually using. Now, additionally, if you use the magnified view with the EVF, you cannot use the LCD to move the magnifier around like you can with touch and drag on the EOS R5 or the other photo cameras. Now, finally, the last option for magnification is black and white during magnification. This controls whether the magnified image is kept in color or if it's converted to grayscale. Using the grayscale option can sometimes aid in focusing. And no, this setting does not affect your recorded images, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, with all that said, there are a couple of limitations to the magnification function, specifically when shooting with the MP4 format. For starters, if you're recording in 8K resolution, the zoom will only be limited to 2x mode. Now be aware, this is MP4 only. This is not a limitation if you are shooting in 8K RAW, you will have all three magnification levels. Secondly, if the HDMI output port is set to 4K, you won't be able to use magnification. Again, weird limitation, don't quite understand why it's there or what the cause of it is. Finally, Anamorphic de-squeeze will be disabled on the magnified image. So if you're working with anamorphic lenses and you punch in with magnification to focus, you will be working with a distorted or squeezed image. So that brings me to the last focus aid, peaking. Peaking on the R5C is a much more comprehensive function than it is on the R5, though it does share the same behavioral oddities. Specifically, on both cameras, the peaking appears to be at least partially, or maybe even entirely, driven by the dual pixel sensor's focus measurements, as both of these cameras have the same directional characteristics in how they handle highlighting things. Specifically, what I'm talking about here are that vertical lines, so those that are aligned with the sensor's focusing sensitivity, are highlighted with the peaking, while horizontal lines aren't. aren't. However, if you rotate the camera 90 degrees, the highlighted edges switch. So it's definitely something in the camera. It's not a product of uh, the lines that you're actually seeing in the real world. Quirks aside, peaking can be toggled on and off several ways. First, peaking for the LCD can be controlled through the direct touch control system. Tap the direct touch control virtual button at the bottom left corner of the LCD, then tap the assistance functions virtual button at the bottom right corner of the LCD. This brings up a touch menu of all the camera assistance functions that are at least available through this menu, including the ability to activate either of the two peaking modes or dis disable them. Now, what exactly happens with this can be a bit confusing at first glance. Turning peaking on and off through the direct touch menu will only turn peaking on and off for the LCD. However, changing the peaking mode from peak one to peak two or vice versa, that affects all of the displays that have peaking enabled. Now, the second approach uses an assigned button function. This is set up through the assignable buttons menus, so find the button you want to use, select it, and change its button function to one of the four peaking options. This would be peaking all, peaking LCD, peaking VF, or peaking HDMI. Now the display specific button functions such as peaking LCD will only toggle peaking on or off for that display. All, of course, will do it for all displays. The final way to activate peaking is through the camera's menus. Head over to the Assistance Function 2 menu page and you'll find all of the peaking settings there. Now the first three entries here control peaking for each of the three display targets, LCD, EVF, and HDMI. When peaking is enabled on any display, a yellow peak with a number next to it badge will be displayed with the Display 1 overlay. So that's the shooting information overlay that provides all of the shooting information that the camera can display. If you don't want to see this, this can be disabled, by, if desired, by going to the Monitoring Setup 5 menu and then to the Custom Display 1 submenu. From there, scroll down to Peaking and set that to Off. Now, as I said, there are two peaking presets available on the R5C, and you can switch between these through either the Direct Touch Control menu, simply tap Peak 1 or 2, 
or by changing the peaking setting on the assistance function to menu page. Now to customize these two presets, we're gonna head over to the assistance function to menu page and look for either peaking one or peaking two at the bottom of the list. Select either of these and it will take you to a submenu where you can change the color, gain, and frequency of that preset. Now of these, color is the easiest to explain and understand. It's simply the color of the peaking highlight. On the R5C, you can choose from white, yellow, red, and blue. Now the best color to use is of course a matter of personal preference. Personally, I find white, yellow, and blue are the most useful for me and generally are my favorites. Yellow tends to be very visible, but oftentimes it can be distracting. For me, white is almost always as obvious as yellow, but isn't quite as distracting because it's not adding another color to the equation. And generally that's my preferred choice. Blue, I find, is good in situations where I have a lot of light colors in the scene and I need something with more contrast. And generally speaking, white and blue are the colors that I have set up for peak one and peak two, respectively, on my camera. Now, the next two settings are gain and frequency. Unfortunately, Canon really doesn't tell you a lot to, about what these do in the manual. So this is based entirely on my observations from testing these two functions. So first is gain, and gain controls how bright the peaking appears to be rendered. At least this is what it seems to be doing. Setting gain to off turns the peaking off entirely for that preset, which is a bit of a weird setting. For the rest of the gain settings, the higher the number, the brighter the peaking highlights will be rendered. A gain of one produces a dim, often almost indiscernible peaking effect, while setting the gain to 15 makes it pretty hard to miss. Increasing the gain has some effect on how peaking will render with depth of field, uh, similar in some respects to how increasing a picture, picture style's sharpening affected the peaking on the EOS R5, but obviously without having any impa impact on the recorded image. Now the final tunable for peaking is frequency. Uh, the most visibly obvious impact of frequency is how prominent the peaking effect becomes. However, unlike gain, this isn't just a simple brightness adjustment. Changing the frequency has a direct impact on what is and isn't highlighted based on the size, uh, hardness of the edge, or, well, frequency of the detail. Note, for example, the speakers and keys on my MacBook Pro here only have the faintest of yellow peaking highlight. However, if I up the frequency setting to 4, telling the peaking system to highlight things with lower frequencies or more strongly handle the frequency side of things, then the highlighting on the keyboard and speakers becomes much more pronounced. So how do you apply frequency in gain? Well, I look at it this way. A higher gain setting will make the highlights brighter, so they'll stand out more. I usually run with a gain setting somewhere in the middle, around 8, but if I have a hard time seeing the peaking effect, the first thing I will do is increase the gain setting to something to make the peaking more prominent. Now, as for frequency, the best setting here, I find, depends on the size and detail of the scene you're working with. If you have a setting that's too high, that can potentially cause the peaking to become distracting by highlighting what really amounts to noise, like fine details that you really don't need to see. While a setting that's too low can make it hard to focus on surfaces with low contrast or fine detail because the peaking just doesn't show up. So that wraps up the focusing aids on the R5C. Now, as a whole, it's important to remember that manual focusing is a skill and it's a perishable one at that. The more you do it, the better you'll get at doing it. Likewise, the longer you're away from it, the more practice you'll need to get back to doing it well. Now that said, one of the best tools I've found for manual focusing is something that's not built into the camera at all. It's a follow focus. And if you're serious about shooting with these kinds of lenses, cinema lenses, or manually focusing video period in general, uh, I would strongly suggest that you consider getting one of these. Even an inexpensive, like, small HD follow focus, which is what I ended up buying because it was the cheapest I could find, dramatically improved my manual focusing experience, made it way easier to do, and the a skill and efficiency that I could do it with. 
Now, all that said, I'm going to wrap this up here. I hope you found this useful or at least interesting. If you did, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. Finally, if you'd like to directly support this channel and content like this, consider hitting that thanks button if you can. It's always appreciated. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.